Welcome back to Top Line to Edmonton, a first round playoff edition. It looks like we're going to do an episode after every two games, as long as the Edmonton Oilers survive. And maybe, did they survive game two uh, up in the series? We're going to talk all about that. As usual, I'm your co-host, Nick Lyman, here with my boy, JC Kenny. How are you doing, JC? Man, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing as good as I can be right now, just in, uh, enjoying beautiful Winnipeg. <laughs> yeah, you know, a bit of snow coming down, April, end of April, but whatever. <laughs> it's all good, playoff hockey. Best the time of year. It. Yeah, so let's, let's dive into game one, a game that... Edmonton kind of threw away. Yeah. Four three overtime loss in Edmonton. LA takes control of home ice advantage. What were your takeaways to start off with game one of the Oilers LA Kings series? Well, we're going off the first 40 minutes. I was almost ready to throw the parade already. Mm -hmm. Edmonton was absolutely rolling a huge, you know, beautiful physical start. They get on the board early. Like, what more can you ask for? You get the crowd involved right away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we'll, just, we'll go in, you know, in depth here with the goals. Like, beautiful play by Dry Saddle, you know, stopping up at the blue line, kind of getting in pucks down low, winning, winning a couple battles. And just the beautiful patience, you know, he doesn't rush in front of the net right away. Kind of kind of loafs, loafs into the zone and gets on the board for the Oilers. But, you know, from what I've seen in the first two games, it's been a lot of undisciplined kind of stupid penalties is what got LA into the, into both games, even you know, especially in the first one when Edmonton had two two goal leads, especially one with eight minutes left in the hockey game, is it just simply cannot cannot be happening in any time, never mind a playoff game. So that one obviously LA rallies back into the game and then come overtime again, Edmonton kind of finds Momentum. They dominated the the entire overtime, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And then the unfortunate penalty where you know LA capitalized almost instantly on the power play to take the series. And you know that's it's kind of the funny thing about playoff hockey. You know you can be in control for almost the entire game, and then all of a sudden, you know the team's still in the in the hockey game. Yeah, no kidding. That I was texting you about this yesterday because we. Game two, we're going to get into a second, but it seems like the Oilers are rocky holding leads again. And I kind of said to you, it reminds me of that Maple Leafs game right around the deadline. That's the <laughs> last time we really saw this team struggle to really bunker down. Yep. And I get why you would have wanted to throw the parade after 40. That <laughs> game was dominating from Edmonton at, on a 5-on-5 five five level. Oh, it was in incredible. They were limiting chances to the outside. There was a few few good opportunities in the slot, but most of the Kings stuff was coming from the outside. The Oilers were all over that home plate area in LA zone. And the numbers reflected that too. If if you look at the game in itself, period by period, in the first period, Edmonton controlled seventy six percent of the expected goals. Uh, fifty eight in the second, sixty Oh, I'm looking at yesterday, sorry. Because um, I was like, why is there no overtime? <laughs> uh, let's let's redo that. 60% in the first period of game one. 75.7 yep. in, in period two. 54 in the third. And 58 in the... In overtime. So you can make a case at five on five. They they won every period. But it was the, the breakdowns that, that cost you. Like, no one's looking at the analytics right now. Everybody, yep. you, You're looking at winning four games the, the quickest. And they kind of shot themselves in the foot. The 16 seconds left. As soon as that went in, I'm like, oh, that's deflating. Like, you oh, really need sure. to pull this one out. Especially in a game where Fiala and Velarde, you're missing, what, 60-something goals on the lineup? Yeah, well, Fiala was the leading scorer in, in total for the LA Kings. Yeah, that's a... That's a big game you feel like you have to have that could have mm -hmm. easily been, I guess, 2 nothing in anyone's favor in this series. The The thing that just obviously bothers me most, it was just a lot of dumb stick penalties, a lot of just undisciplined plays, and mm -hmm. penalties that are 200 feet away from your own goal. And 
you just can't afford to have that in the playoffs. It doesn't matter how skilled of a team you are. Mm-hmm. And it's very weird that we're starting to see this trend now when the last 15 to 20 games, Edmonton was playing almost perfect hockey. Yeah, not the time of year you want to see that stuff seep in. Um, in that game, we saw a lot of Kopitar versus Drysdale, which is kind of what we expected. Mm-hmm. Deneau versus McDavid. Uh, what were your kind of thoughts on uh, the Oilers going head-to-head against the big guys in L.A.? Um, honestly, as far as I originally thought, as far as matchups go, I was not really worried at all. You have McDavid and Drysdale, and that's the advantage over pretty much any team you're playing at, against. Mm-hmm. Um, but wow, that being said, I will say Drysdale has had the clear advantage over the, the Kopitar line, in my opinion. Obviously, Drysdale is off to the, the hot start, but I have to give Philip Deneau and his line mates a lot of credit. He has mm-hmm. kept Connor McDavid in check the almost the, so far the entire series, obviously. He's, McDavid's had a couple breaks, which is going to happen. But yeah, as far as productivity and, you know, grade A chances, Deneau is, has kept, kept him in check and actually has gone gotten on the board a lot of times in that first game against the McDavid line. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's what's interesting. Kopitar, four points in that first game. Two of that on the power play, of course. Yeah. Um, I think I got a, I got a question for you. Is Connor McDavid hurt? That's what I – like, we kind of had a brief conversation uh, after the game last night. It kind of looks – that he's either hurt or under the weather. He just doesn't look like his true self, uh, his true self at the moment. There's been breaks where obviously you know he kind of has the rush where he kind of looks like himself. Mm-hmm. But then there's plays where you know you can tell, you can see the opportunity where you can you know kind of break to the net or take have that breakaway speed. And it just doesn't look like it's there right now. Mm-hmm. So I mean, obviously I hope he's rather under the weather than hurt because you obviously can recover from that a lot quicker. I do. I I feel like it's got to be something nagging and then obviously the the credit of philip to know keeping them in check it's got to be a little bit of both in my opinion well it's funny because watching that first period game one i kind of even tweeted out like if this is the mcdavid we're well, gonna see all playoffs thing. look out and we didn't up. we haven't seen any like hits or any like incidents where he could have gotten hurt mm-hmm. and he was absolutely flying in that first period and then he after drew, what, that, two penalties he right away back yeah. to, like beating four guys didn't score, but he was all over that game. And then out of nowhere, a, a pretty pedestrian back 40. Yeah. He was actually on for both Kopitar's lines, goals um, at 5-on-5. Five five. I think he was on for three out of the four, if I'm not mistaken. It sounds about right. And, you know, you're kind of hoping for a big bounce back but uh, in game two. So let's get, in, get into game Before two. Before we start game two, I want to hear your thoughts on that overtime penalty. The DeHarnay stick infraction. Uh, yeah, I, 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 and maybe I'm kind of sounding biased here. I just think it is complete bullshit considering what could have been called during the entire game and even in the overtime for both sides. Absolutely. Like, don't get me wrong. I just feel like that was a very lame penalty to kind of draw the line on. Like there was plenty of opportunity for, like I said, both teams where it's a more clear cut penalty than that. And obviously that's the game winner. So maybe I'm even more bitter on it. I, I think it was a fine call because it, the scoring opportunity was there. Okay. And if, if you're going to call a penalty in the playoffs, which we know the refs do put it away, yeah. I want them calling an opportunity when there's a goal because without that without that call, you just took away like a two-on-one, right? And like yeah. those I'm not – I get why people would be upset because of the, the, the look of it and the way it happened. But it was like the carelessness of the stick that caused that, yeah. and you lose the scoring opportunity. I didn't have that much of an issue with it. Okay, and yeah, I don't, in my I just thought like they're obviously battling for the puck. It was kind of a, a race there, and it looked like he DeHarnay got kind of pulled down. Yeah. But I do agree it was it was a kind of a careless play. It was a penalty. Like don't get me wrong, but like yeah. whistles do go away in the playoffs. I just feel like you know in the third period, even in overtime, there was more more stuff that probably could have been called that was more. I, I will say, that. I will say, with the bias thing, which organization's fan base has cried about playoff <laughs> penalties not <laughs> being not called, right now. not being called, and now you want to put the whistle on? No, <laughs> I, respe- I respect, that is not the reason they lost the game. They made a lot of dumb <laughs> plays. The, 
I know exactly where you're going with this. And they're complaining about the refs that the game hasn't even started yet. So hey, I'm just saying, we've heard all about oh, McDavid hasn't drawn enough in the playoffs. And hey, now we want to put the whistles well, away. The penalties are, what, 10-3, 10-4? No, at all, almost all of those calls, Edmonton absolutely deservingly so. Yeah. I, but there has been some plays where it's kind of questionable. Okay, moving into game two. <laughs> 4-2, Edmonton evens up the series. Mm -hmm. Honestly, probably a must win, just given the split. What was your big takeaways from game two? Much like the first game, an absolute insane start. The shots were almost like 15-0. I don't think LA didn't even get a shot till one, two minutes left in the period of the first. Um, again, another physical, you know, you're getting on the board first. Mm -hmm. Early, again, getting the crowd involved. And then again, like just stupid, undisciplined penalties getting mm -hmm. LA back into the hockey game. Five on five play. Edmonton has been the far and away better yeah. hockey team right now. Not close. And it's, it's not. This is what's driving me nuts because they were not doing it for so long. Like, I get it if you had the trouble the entire year, mm -hmm. but you had a 20 game stretch where you're playing very disciplined hockey and not, you know, chasing in your own end. <coughs> and they just keep going back to it. I just. I just don't get why it's happening. There's so many stick penalties. Like, for Drysdale's monster start, he had the, the dumb slash on Kempe mm -hmm. to get them on the power play. And then he had a trip where he's like five, six feet away from the puck and he's reaching in on Byfield skate. Like, it's just kind of, you know, head scratching plays. But then again, you know, Edmonton wills themselves back to victory. Um, and obviously, like, like you said, that's a must win. You're down two going to L.A. with those tough matchups. I think you'd be in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. I do think Stewart Skinner has to stop both those goals. He did make some pretty nice, timely saves mm -hmm. in that hockey game. But I just, in my opinion, both those goals cannot be in in a, in a playoff hockey game. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the one thing I'll say, for – LA's credit, we talked about how the first game at 5-on-5, five five, a lot of their offense was coming from the outside. It did feel like they were a bit more dangerous in this one. They still rely on those D to get pucks through quite a bit, but they were generating a lot in the slot and mm -hmm. the bottom of the circles. Like They were in that general area compared to game one. Like you said, you kind of hit the nail on the head. At 5-on-5, five five, this hasn't even been a comparable series. But the undisciplinedness and the the special teams battle is really keeping LA in this. To, to your credit here on the shots and whatnot, in that first period in all situations, 26 to 9 shot attempts for in Edmonton's favor. Though the rest of the game, 21 27 LA in the mm -hmm. second. Now, a lot of that was special teams. Yep. And then 18 24 in the third for LA. However, in that third period, the quality was a lot worse for LA than yeah. earlier in that game. The expected goals, despite that discrepancy, was 61 20, uh, 39 for the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah. And yeah, that special teams really is the story. I agree. Skinner, it's not like Skinner's been bad, but he hasn't been great. Like, he hasn't. And uh, I don't know if they need him to steal the series, but I would get why they're. In the back of people's mind, there'd be a little concern, but... The thing is, like I, I said even before the season, season started, they almost needed a goal you can just make, you know, make that timely save. doesn't need to, you know, will them to victory or keep them in it. What he has, like, there was plays in game two on the, you know, power play where there was, like, a, the mm -hmm. Arvidsson one-timer, and, there's you know, a couple one-timers where Skinner had to stand, stand tall. And he did, but then you, obviously, you get into the goals... And it's just kind of a mishap play where Deneau kind of gets to walk in. And he makes a big save, obviously, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But after that, there's no angle there. Like, I just don't get how that goes into the net. Mm -hmm. And then even in the, uh, like, the uh, the Velarde goal, a nice play by L.A., you know, forcing a turnover. And he has a little breakaway. Mm -hmm. But he, like, he, like, doesn't even get a shot off. And it somehow trickles into the net. Like, I just feel like you can't afford that in a tight hockey game at all. Yeah, another thing... Uh, that changed in game two is the Oilers are now running seven and 11. Um, yeah. Which obviously changes the matchup game a bit. I like it. I like the idea of 11 7 for the Oilers at home because it allows you to get McDavid and Dry sell some extra, uh, extra shifts. We saw Dry starting to get some shifts on the cost and Derek Ryan line. He kind of took some shifts there. 
Um, we saw Nuge kind of get bumped around. We saw him with Yamamoto and Dry Settle for large portions of that game. Yep. We saw we saw McDavid, Dry Settle, and Kane for one shift, and I was wondering, is he thinking about that here? And I'm not sure I'd be going there, but I wouldn't go there for an entire game. No. But I was surprised in certain situations, like a couple icings where LA was tired. I was surprised Woodcroft didn't go to a a McDavid dry style stack, mm-hmm. you know, at, at any time where he kind of stuck away from that uh, line. So what do you expect to see with eleven and seven heading into LA? How do you think they're going to kind of match it, uh, manage this, and what does it mean for LA trying to line match in their home building? I really think it's what we saw in game two is going to be a lot of like uh, for the remainder of the series. If Edmonton continues to go 11 and seven, mm-hmm. I feel like LA only in certain situations, they can kind of get away from it, but they're going to want to stick with, you know, the, the Kopitar dry sidle or Dino McDavid as much as they can. So as far as it looks for Edmonton, I feel like it's going to be very similar to game two. While you can, you know, squeeze McDavid or Dreisaitl out there for a couple extra minutes. And that's personally why I like the 11-7. and seven. Mm-hmm. It gives you that opportunity to give them some extra minutes. So I feel like it's going to be a lot of similar to, to game two. Yeah, I'm very curious to see how LA plays this. I almost wonder if LA starts to get creative. You know, Dano, McDavid, Kopitar, Dreisaitl. I wonder if they try and create a third line now with scoring now that Fialo and Villardi are back and trying to create a matchup advantage for themselves. Is Fialo back now? I'm pretty sure, no? Everything I've heard, he hasn't even started skating yet. If he's back, that is a very serious-changing aspect to to this right now. Because I I got a text the other day, and I didn't look into it myself, but I got a text just saying that, like, Holy shit, uh, LA might be adding like 60-something goals between him and Velarde. Which is obviously a huge ad, but Velarde makes, good for Velarde making an impact right, uh, right away into the series. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm not finding any updates on Fiala right now. Um, not returning Wednesday, so obviously we knew that. Yeah. That's, I, okay, I think that's going to be the big conversation then, is do they get Kevin Fiala back? Yeah. Uh, I think I think I was... I think I was feeling he was going to play because there seemed to be smoke he might get into that okay. game too. So, right. Yeah, it, it was kind of weird because I, I did hear that he was near return, but then I also heard situations where he hasn't even started skating and the only way he can come back is like a, a game seven. Mm-hmm. So Which is huge. That is obviously something to keep an eye on. I feel like if LA does end up getting decimated, they honestly might rush him a little early, but mm-hmm. obviously only time will tell on that. So what do we what do we think game what do you hope game three looks like from an Edmonton Oilers fan base perspective? Honestly, much like the first two games, minus the the stupid undisciplined done undisciplined penalties, mm-hmm. they've they've been the the better team on five on five. Um, they really they don't need to reinvent the wheel at all right now. I mm-hmm. I do like that uh, Kane and Nuge have switched where Kane's now with McDavid. Yeah. And Nuge is with Dry Sidle, so I think it's more natural fit every time I've watched the different duos. Yeah, and obviously when McDavid did take off, he was with Kane and Hyman. So that's what I'm looking for. Just the same kind of the same old as game one and two. Less penalties, obviously if they stick to the stick to their game, they're gonna get on the power play. I'm really not not worried about the special teams right now. Yeah. So just just make LA earn everything they have to do, like earn the power plays, <laughs> the you know the cane delay of game, the silly stick penalties, like those aren't getting earned by LA. We're getting we're letting them back into the hockey game. Yeah, and I think I think that's kind of my story. Um, that I'm going to be watching with the Edmonton Oilers the rest of the series, even if they get through. I really want to see them start buckling down on these two goal leads, um, just because we have seen it most of the year, more in the early part of the year, be a problem for that group. Then it seemed like they sorted it out. Yep. And now it's bleeding black back in it again at the wrong time. So I think that's the big story for me right now on Edmonton's run. Oh, absolutely. And, of course, you can't undersell it. Connor McDavid looking like Connor McDavid again. That That is going to be the key player in any individual series. So... I want to see more out of Connor McDavid, which is not something 
I expected to say no, after I'm two right there games. With you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, is there anything to play off Leon, though? I got an Oilers buddy reached out yesterday. Play, play off Leon, unironically the best player in the NHL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, where, where, where are you at with playoff Leon Draisaitl? Dude, he's an absolute monster. Like, mm-hmm. he is so strong on the puck. I didn't. We pointed this out before. It's crazy how fast McDavid plays and then versus how slow Drysaddle plays. You see so many replays of him just casually entering the zone and then all of a sudden the puck's on his stick and it's in the back of the net. I just – he's on an absolute mission right now and I don't – I can't see anything stopping him besides a, another injury. Well, game three goes tomorrow. Game – Four would be then Sunday. Yep. So we'll likely record again Sunday or, well, no, Sunday will be late. We'll likely record again Monday. Monday, yeah. Um, very curious to see where this series sits after uh, two more games. Yeah, what are your three and four predictions? I'm going to go, I'm going to say they split. Split? I think they're going to split the both in LA. Yeah, that's what I was, I was kind of feeling. I think it's going to be a split going 2-2 back to Edmonton, which I, I'm fine with, honestly. Well, there we go. So let's see what happens. Obviously, JC probably hopes he's wrong. He's probably hoping for a a two and zero weekend. Oh, but absolutely. As long as they split, they're still in control, right? So we'll see how the Edmonton Oilers look after these next two games, and we'll be back to talk about it Monday. Right on, go Oilers! I I refuse to say that. <laughs>